we're going to start by discussing the easier concept, which is stereotype, because this is really just a cognitive process that um, is a function of learning and the way that our brains consolidate information. And so this is maybe the least um, emotionally triggering of all of the um, processes that we're going to discuss. So let's start by defining it. And I'll go through this a little bit quickly because you have the learning module that um, repeats some of the information. Um, but stereotypes are the characteristics associated with a group and its members often through overgeneralization. So it's more about concepts versus feelings or um, behavior. It's just associations in our brain. So some of the relevant neuroanatomy um, related to stereotyping is your temporal lobe and your prefrontal cortex. So you are familiar with those um, parts of the brain by this point. But this lecture, we're going to um, get a little bit more specific in terms of specifying which part of the temporal lobe we're talking about, which part of the prefrontal cortex. Um, but in general, if you are not like a pre-health um, student, you don't have to memorize these. Um, it's just for also making this whole talk a little bit more legitimate, right? Because we like that biological information that it's true. Um, so the temporal lobe is involved in the semantic or episodic memory. Prefrontal cortex is involved in your categorical thinking. Um, it considers bits of information, it looks for patterns, it chooses a strategic action, and that action often involves the inferior frontal um, gyrus. So even when we're talking about stereotypes and we're talking about just like associations, even the neural connections in our brain are associated with like thinking about behaviors, planning out behaviors, because really stereotypes are kind of a protective mechanism, right? Um, if we see this particular item that's associated with this particular danger, we need to avoid that, right? So it's all about trying to figure out easy strategies um, of what to do or how we should respond in a, in a situation. And this part it is a review on learning and how our brain consolidates information. You have a lot of the videos in the modules. And so um, again, I'll go through this quickly, but learning involves repetition. Um, the more that we hear something, the more we read something, the more we see something, the stronger that memory is consolidated. Um, just like walking through a path in the forest, the more that you walk down it, the clearer that path is, and the quicker you're, you'll be able to find it next time you're there. Same thing with um, you know, the neural basis of memory. We make these stronger and stronger synaptic connections, and then we find it. And so um, also um, learning is affected by the emotional, um, the emotional response to a situation, to an object, to a person. And so things that trigger our emotions, things that are more, um, you know, make us fearful, make us angry, um, make us sad, those memories will probably be embedded in our memory longer. Um, things that are threatening, kind of the same thing, right? So anytime the amygdala is involved in um, anything, it makes it a whole lot stronger, especially memories. Um, we look for patterns, um, especially when we're talking about stereotypes, we see patterns and often those patterns are um, put into place by things other than ourselves. So the media um, for one, and then novelty. And so this kind of works um, in maybe like a little contradictory, fashion. So we do tend to pay attention to more novel things. So especially if we are maybe growing up in a homogenized culture, and then we encounter someone from a different culture or a different race, 
we will pay attention, but the things that we tend to focus on are probably going to be the negative and scary things, and those are going to make the stronger memories. So all of these things are involved in stereotyping. And remember, making a memory actually involves lots of steps. So the first is attention, and attention is more like a filter than a flashlight, right? We often wish we could just have a tunnel vision when we're focused, you know, trying to focus on work and get things done, but really attention just filters out the other stuff. And that's why, um, you know, people tapping on their pencil during a test or whatever, sometimes that can be too overwhelming because you can't filter it out. Um, now, what do we filter out? We usually filter out things that don't um, agree with our preconceived notions. We tend to filter in the scary things, the things that make us mad. We also tend to filter in all the negative stuff. So you have this input from the environment and you have all of these filters. And you know, the, um, the way that you filter information can also um, be influenced by your mood, if you're hungry, um, your history, um, your attitude. So especially if we're anxious already, if we are tired or scared or, um, or if we are put in a situation where we're meant to feel scarcity, then we tend to stereotype a lot more. And this is because we tend to filter um, just the right amount of information that we don't really want to filter in. But then we make sense of it in our head. So we um, filter in, you know, um, there is a car behind me, there are red and blue lights. I see those things, but then we have to make sense of them, right? Okay, well, that means that there's a place behind me. And how do I feel about that? And what does that mean? And what is my behavior because of that? Um, how are they going to treat me? All of these different things are occurring really rapidly in your brain to help you figure out how to behave whenever you encounter some a stereotype. And then it's tied to our emotional state, right? And then linked to our behavior. So again, we do tend to have a negativity bias, which negative stimuli elicit a larger um, brain response than positive ones. So um, one of the first semesters that I taught this class, I mean, um, we kind of expanded even beyond what we expand on today. And, um, you know, I worked so hard to make it interactive and I was so excited and I got a lot of feedback. I got a lot of positive feedback that I got one um, piece of feedback from a student. Of course, it was anonymous um, saying that this was the worst class he's ever taken and he, it was the biggest waste of time. And that's the one that I remember, right? Because that's the one that one triggered an emotion, that's the one that was negative. And even though I know that there were like 70 other students and lots of other things, unfortunately that's, that's what I remember. And we tend to do that, right? We tend to remember only the negative things. And so being aware of this actually can help um, because we have to, you know, um, put effort into to really paying attention or at least balancing some of what we pay attention to. And so um, differences in negativity bias also have been linked to political ideology. So um, take that for whatever you will. So some research suggests that conservatives might have stronger psychological responses to negative information than liberals. Um, and so some evidence, for example, has found that people who consider themselves politically conservative are more likely to rate ambiguous stimuli as threatening. And so we're going, going to get into this whenever we talk about even facial processing. But um, is this a function of political ideology? Probably not. It's probably more of a function of, you know, the um, uh, how motivated they are to check that bias because we all actually probably have this negativity bias and really you can even push more politically um, liberal people into um, fearing or into focusing on that negativity um, 
on the negative um, aspects. If you set up the situation right, um, negativity bias is actually stronger when it involves a threat to our survival. So if we see an angry face, we are biased to pay attention to that negative emotion. That makes sense, right? And so because of the surge in activity in a critical information processing area of the brain, our behaviors and attitudes um, tend to be shaped more powerfully by bad news, experiences, and information, right? Um, and the media tends to take um, advantage of this particular phenomenon. So remember, you do have different forms of memory. You have the short-term memory. You have long-term memory. You have long-lasting memory, like the really long-term memory. You have procedural memory and, and motor memory, emotional memory. And all of those things actually get sent to different parts of the brain. So the hippocampus is definitely involved in consolidating um, memories to long-term memories. But the amygdala really helps. And also, um, if your stress response system is activated and everything, um, all the chemicals involved in that, those actually help strengthen your um, memory too. And that's probably a function of survival, right? Um, but it's very unfortunate when we're talking about stereotypes. So again, we have learning, we have um, repetition, emotional um, salience, threatening, patterns and novelty. So our, our brains are programmed to pay attention to the unusual um, and the categorization that exists um, or the categorization that happens is actually associated with um, knowledge that already exists. So we're looking for patterns so we can reinforce some of those pathways that we've already um, laid down. And then it gets put into different places in the brain it, again. And so remember, we consolidate memories into groups and we tend to link these groups. And that's why whenever you can't think of the word, uh, you start thinking of words that are kind of associated with it, even if it's rhyming or um, it's the same shape or color or whatever, because those have connections in your brain because you've put them in a similar category and eventually you get to the word you're trying to think of. Um, Unfortunately, we do this with people too and, and social groups. So this video is actually in the module, so I will skip it for now, but you should watch it. And it is about schemas. Um, schemas are exactly what we already said. These like categories, these groups in, in our brain. Um, and so, you sense something, you pay attention to it. It maybe stimulates you in a physical way, in an emotional way. You recall the information from your memory, you activate the adequate schema, and then you respond. And so again, all of these stereotypes, even though we're just talking about the cognitive constructs, um, they are related to um, how we plan to act. Then the other thing to know is priming. So neurons that fire together, wire together. So um, if you remember, uh, if your only exposure to a certain social category is associated with a certain dress type, a certain um, music type, a certain emotion, then when you see someone in that category or hear someone or hear the music or see someone wearing those clothes, or if that emotion is triggered, everything else tends to get triggered too. And um, the psychological tests that show this concept of priming are pretty cool. So um, even though the stereotyping is not, um, if you are going to a um, interview and you hand the person a warm cup of coffee or a warm tea, um, it is more likely that they will rate you as warm and friendly because of the schemas and because of this priming effect. 
if you hand them a cold drink or if they're holding a cold drink, it's more likely that they are going to um, perceive you as cold and unfriendly. Stereotypes. So same thing as schemas, but we're activating different parts of our brain. So the anterior um, temporal lobe is basically where you store what the stereotype is. So the actual like semantic details, the medial prefrontal cortex assigns meaning to it. So think of our social classes. So um, darker skin or female gender. And then what does that mean? But also like, what does it mean in relation to our um, other schemas in our brain, right? And then the inferior frontal gyrus is associated with planning behaviors in response to that stereotype. And a lot of times this is about either avoidance, right? Like survival behaviors or um, engagement, especially if um, it is a beneficial stereotype or a beneficial social group or whatever, right? Um, but race as a category, as a social category, tends to have a different valence than other groups. So, um, and remember, the people who are being studied in these research, um, you know, articles are part of usually the U.S. or U.K., some kind of Western culture um, where race, you know, means something significant. And so, um, interestingly, Williams syndrome. Um, is a neurodevelopment disorder we've talked about before. And there's an absence of social fear, which is interesting because even though we haven't brought in um, the prejudice part of that, which is the emotional response to the stereotype, um, in a syndrome where they don't have social fear, they do have intact gender stereotypes, but they don't make racial stereotypes for some reason. And so that probably says more about our culture than the actual syndrome, but um, interesting observation nonetheless. So again, this is just another model of the learning and memory system by which we um, create these stereotypes. And then social, social categorization occurs really, really rapidly. And I have a different slide that I'll show you in a, in a little while, but really be, before we've even processed what we're seeing, we have already categorized what we're looking at in terms of social status, in terms of gender and sex and power, that happens very quickly. Um, and we tend to have this, um, kind of like radial grouping, right? Just like we saw with our memory categorization or our schemas, right? We also have that with social categories. Um, and so we look at something and we analyze it and we group it and we see if it fits in the groups that we've already made in our head. And this is just basically what stereotyping is. We do tend to um, use both positive and negative stereotypes, right? And some people have the perception that, well, maybe negative or positive stereotypes don't really um, have a negative impact, but they do. They actually, um, both, both kinds of stereotypes can affect targets, emotional and psychological states, um, and also others' judgments of them, because if they don't fit well within that stereotype, then where do they exist? And there's like this kind of depersonalization, you know, I just don't fit into that group, whatever. And it can cause significant distress, but it can also objectify people, right? Even if we think it's a good stereotype, it's probably something, um, you know, more negative underlying it. And then interestingly, the way that we um, make even these positive stereotypes really is a function of the perceived threat that the dominant group feels. And so um, there tends to be these um, positive stereotypes. So like for warmth or competence, um, you usually don't have a positive stereotype for both of them. Usually a positive stereotype means that you're probably gonna have a corresponding negative stereotype. 
And so if that's all you need to just avoid the positive stereotypes, then do it. Um, stereotypes affect behavior, and this is also in the module, so I'll just go through it really quickly. Um, even for the group, so a stereotype threat, um, when we are thinking of a stereotype, sometimes like it's too distressful and our performance um, wavers because of it. And it also depends on um, how sly the researchers are um, about uh, bringing up the stereotype. So in all of these studies, they don't, um, usually they don't explicitly bring it up. They usually prime with something that they know is associated with a certain social category, and that's how they prime for, like, a, remind people of stereotypes. So um, Asian American women took a math test, um, and so Asians, the positive stereotype is that they're really good at math, but for women, um, it's actually a negative stereotype, um, and the belief is that they're bad for math. I know that when I was younger, I remember, um, you know, there were articles and headlines about how math how girls just don't have math genes. And that's what I grew up thinking. Um, and so that was just a given, right? And so we have these social categories and these associations that are strongly connected throughout our life because we hear them over and over. And then that affects our behavior. So um, Asian American women took a math test. Those who were primed to think about their racial identity did better than those who were primed to think about their gender. Um, African Americans did worse on tests when priming, after priming, especially when paired with an examiner of a different race. And in the notes section of the slides, I have links to the article. So if you're interested, you can read more about this. Um, but this is the um, stereotype threat um, for African Americans, especially when they were paired with um, someone. Um, who was white or not African American or black. So when they weren't reminded of the stereotype, here's the test score. And then look, when they were, significant decrease. Um, and it was particularly, um, you know, large whenever they, uh, the person giving the test was white. So here we go. So what can we learn from this? Well, um, anytime that you ever take a standardized test, including an IQ test, um, SAT test, eighth grade, third grade, whatever kind of standardized test, think of the bubbles that you fill in before you take the test. It's usually your name, it's usually your race. Um, and so one of the ways that we can um, counteract some of this, because we're not gonna take away someone's associations, right? Because they've learned that throughout life because of media, because of all these messages. Yes, we need to tackle that, but that's probably not gonna be tackled like in a day. So what can you do? Well, maybe save those questions for the end so you're not reminding people um, and triggering them uh, to do worse. And actually that has been shown to be beneficial. <laughs>